I consider ruxolitinib for patients who have myelofibrosis when I feel that um, their constitutional symptoms, their splenomegaly, are compromising their quality of life. And frankly, ruxolitinib is the only drug that we have available for the treatment of myelofibrosis. Uh, sometimes patients who present with anemia as a sole cytopenia in myelofibrosis and tend to not have uh, large spleen or constitutional symptoms, they will be treated uh, accordingly, in essence, with agents that might improve their hemoglobin. Uh, so I may not necessarily consider ruxolitinib in that uh, instance, but someone who has uh, significant constitutional symptoms, splenomegaly, would be a person that I think would benefit greatly. And then, of course, we have to stay within the FDA indication because the drug is uh, approved for people who have intermediate to and high-risk disease. So if I have a patient that fits that profile and has high-risk disease, they will be treated accordingly. Patients who are started on ruxolitinib uh, with, for the indication of myelofibrosis usually um, utilize a dose that's based on the platelet count. So if the platelet count is between 100,000 and 200,000, then you, you start with 15 milligrams twice a day. For patients who have a platelet count greater than 200,000, then you start with 20 milligrams twice a day. And then, of course, you need to monitor the uh, for cytopenias moving forward and then adjust the dose accordingly. And I think it's very important to also uh, recognize that kidney dysfunction and liver dysfunction may also figure into the dosing of this agent. I think all clinicians, people who prescribe this agent, need to look at the kidney function and the GFR and utilize the dose, or I should say, um, figure out the dose accordingly. There's been multiple analyses that have tackled the issue of survival when it comes to the utilization of ruxolitinib in patients with myelofibrosis. And this was particularly um, addressed in the COMFORT-1 and COMFORT-2 trials that have um, resulted in the approval of ruxolitinib in the United States as well as Europe. So if you looked at the COMFORT-2 study, which was um, the trial that took place in Europe, uh, there has been a recent uh, publication by Dr. Harrison, and there they uh, noted that patients who had been on ruxolitinib uh, did have a survival advantage, that the drug actually resulted in 30% reduction in risk of death. Now, the problem with the interpretation of the survival data when it comes to the COMFORT-2 trial as well as the COMFORT-1 as well, is that those trials allowed for crossover. So um, anytime you end up um, crossing over from one arm to the next, survival analysis becomes somewhat compromised. But I think using certain statistical analyses, um, censoring perhaps for the time of crossover <clears throat> is what um, resulted in the realization that actually a survival advantage does exist despite the fact that those patients did cross over. Now, there's also um, a, um, an analysis that was done, sort of a pooled uh, analysis of both trials, COMFORT-1 and COMFORT-2, and also published, uh, I want to say, last year in September, and it was by Dr. Verstovchek. And what he did is that he followed the patients who had been on both trials uh, and at the five-year mark reported on the survival of the patients that had been assigned on an intent to treat, essentially, whether or not they received roxolitinib or placebo, whether or not they crossed over. So, uh, and again, in this trial, it was demonstrated very similar to Claire Harrison's evaluation or analysis of the COMFORT-2 that there was a reduction in hazard ratio for death. And they utilized also uh, like a specific um, statistical methodology. I think they called it uh, um, rank preserving structural failure time. And this statistical tool is supposed to sort of eliminate the bias that results from the crossover of the uh, patient population that were randomized from the get-go. Um, and again, uh, as in COMFORT-2, there, there seems to be a survival advantage. Now, uh, granted, um, it would be obviously important to demonstrate uh, this survival advantage moving forward, uh, but I'm not sure that those trials will be done, to be perfectly honest. It may not actually be ethical to do.